glasses are actually scratched. They, they, they look like, they are a little dirty, but they're, they're scratches on them. That's I what saw they, food on it. <laughs> yeah, well, a little, but there's still like a really bad scratch there. Yeah, I put it, was, in my it was pocket. on the other lens. <laughs> I once had breakfast with Pastor Matt where he got butter on his glasses. That was it. That he was got weird. what? Yeah, was butter. butter. Oh. I just lunch. What? It was lunch. No, it was breakfast. You weren't there. He needs Okay, so. He needs windshield wipers on his glasses. Right? So we are getting started first. Uh, thank you to the Isaacs for our bearded irises. Yep. Did I get that right? Uh, grown right in Connie's Point, so they look very beautiful. A um, couple other things. I want to cover a few announcements first. And I don't have my cheat sheet with me. Can you grab my cheat sheet off my desk? My little square with all the dates. Oh, um, sure. So while he's getting that, I don't want to mess up my camp dates. Uh, I want to let everybody know that we do still have copies of the prayer journals available if anybody would like one. We've got them out in the foyer. For anybody online, you can go to usacanadaregion.org slash pray and get all the materials downloaded there. You can also download an app for your phone or tablet. Just search for Half Million Mobilization. And all that stuff is free, so everybody can get it. Um, this coming Saturday is going to be the breakfast for Salem County Men for Christ and Salem County Women for Christ. The men are going to be here at our church at 8 a.m. And the women are going to be at Sharptown United Methodist at 10 a.m. Um, so that covers this Saturday. Next Saturday, the 28th, thank you very much, will be uh, our food pantry day. We had a wonderful phone call from Pastor Tom over at the mission today. Um, they were able to find a big corporate donor that donated several hundred hams. So the mission is in the process of, of distributing those hams to several different food pantries. And they're sending a bunch over to us. So a uh, special thank you to the Sunday yeah, Breakfast great. Mission. I don't know the name of the company that donated <coughs> that, but if we find out, we'll give them a thank you too. Uh, but it was beautiful. He got, I think he said 600 hams were donated. Um, and so they're using some at the mission and then they're distributing them to a bunch of other food pantries. So um, yeah, that's a huge blessing. Um, it's, it was kind of a specific prayer of ours. The last several months we've had lots of chicken and turkey but we haven't had other meat, and we were kind of saying, God, thank you very much for that. Could we maybe have something different? Because people are looking for something different. And we got hams this month. So. Abraham. What was that? <laughs> Abraham. There we go. <laughs> if I ever uh, start a, a deli, that's what it's going to be called. <laughs> um, but, um, I said ham and eggs. <laughs> yeah, so we're going to have, we know some of the things we're going to have for pantry already. We're going to have eggs for every family, we're going to have hams, we do still have some chickens and turkeys available. We're going to have hot dogs. Yeah. Um, we're going to, we should have hot dogs for every family, and of course we're going to have our um, non-perishable food items that we always give out. She puts on green, green eggs so you can get green, green eggs and ham. ham. We'll leave that up to people, they can do what they want. But um, thank you to everybody who has donated. Um, we have a few people joining us already. Venus and Jane are both with us. Hello, Venus and Jane. Uh, so we were just sharing some announcements and some praises. So a um, couple other things coming up, and I'll try to do these in chronological order. On June 11th, that's a Saturday, we're going to do a work day here at the church from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. We have some inside cleaning and kind of fixer-upper kind of stuff going on. We've got some outside work, including some flower work. And um, so whatever your skill level or physical ability, we have lots of different things going on. We are providing lunch. So if you are going to come, um, there's a sign up on the table out in the foyer, or you can let me know. Um, we just want to get a rough head count to make sure we have enough food for lunch. Because there's nothing worse than running out of pizza. Well, maybe not having it. So that's June 11th. Then the next week is the beginning of teen camp. Teen camp is June 19th through 24th. If you register before June 1st, you get a discounted rate. So if anybody's interested and needs help registering, please let me know. We do have scholarship money available. Um, I know we are already giving out one scholarship. So 
thank you to the person who donated and how awesome that we get to send a team to camp who wasn't able to go. Amen. Um, family camp down at Irma in Cape May is June 25th to July 1st. If you'd like to go down and stay the whole time, you can go to Irma Camp's website. Um, Shannon, starts with a G. Anyway, her contact info is on the, the um, on Irma Camp's website. Kipple, Kipple, Kipple. Can you look? Because this is going to bug me. Look for Irma Bolina's camp. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Gipple. I'm going to go with Gipple. We'll see if I'm right. Um, you can register if you want to bring a camper down or stay in one of the cabins or you can even tent camp. They have like a shower house and stuff so if you want to sleep in a tent you can still have the shower and bathrooms and stuff. Um, several of us are going to be going back and forth to attend the evening sessions. Every evening during camp there's a big family session in the Tabernacle where we have worship and our special speaker for the week is Dr. Stephen Manley. Uh, he was also here last year. Uh, so I don't know what he's talking on this year. Last year we, we studied the Sermon on the Mount the whole time. And that seems to have been a theme that God keeps bringing up this year. So we'll see what comes up next. Um, then after that, <clears throat> July 27th, sorry, June 27th through July 1st is Al Azar's basketball camp down at the Mission. They are looking for volunteers. So if you are able to volunteer to help with that, please go to sundaybreakfastmission.org and you can sign up there to be a volunteer. They need lots of different kinds. If you know how to be a basketball coach, that's wonderful. If you don't, that's okay. If all you have to do is repeat the instructions from the head coach. That's what Pastor Tom says. So I can't play basketball. Any of you good at basketball? Gipple. Gipple. That was close. Did I say Gipple or Gipple? What did you say her... her <coughs> She's like the contact person, or I don't know. Yeah, she is. She handles all the reservations for camp. Oh. So if you want to bring a camper down or try to get a room or anything like that, she's the one to talk to, and she handles the contact through the website. Yeah. I think she also manages her Facebook page. But she is the person to talk to. We've got basketball camp. Then one other camp, uh, our district kids camp, is July 7th through 11th. So that's children and preteen. Um, the children's and preteens events are separate, but they're at the same camp during the same week. And last, but certainly not least, uh, Salem Hospice is looking for volunteers. So if you are interested in volunteering with hospice, we uh, can get you connected there. Um, Darlene or Diane are two good people to talk to um, if you have questions about that. Um, this isn't necessarily like going and, and doing medical care for someone. They need volunteers to spend time with people, to visit with people, um, and just minister with presence. So if that's something you feel God tugging on your heart to do, let us know and we can help connect you. I think you guys probably know the need for hospice is always greater than the number of volunteers. So, um, And of course you also know I think that this is a lot more than just medical care that's being offered. It's a difficult season of life and an important one to minister. Um, now, we've got some prayer requests. <clears throat> I think I'll start with our international requests, and then we'll bring it back home. Um, our country that we are praying for tonight from our missions newsletter is the country of Argentina. So Argentina is on the southern part of South America. So you know, South America kind of comes down, and they're right in here. If you've ever heard of the region of Patagonia, that's in Argentina. Um, so, the Church of the Nazarene began its work in Argentina in 1919, so over a hundred years ago. Um, Argentina is located in the southern half of South America. It borders the Atlantic Ocean and lies between Chile and Uruguay. It covers an area of over 1.7 mil 1 million square miles, so it is the largest Spanish-speaking nation in the world by land area. It is a really, really big country. Um, let's see. Argentina's highest point, Aconcagua, is uh, 6,900 meters or 22,000 feet above sea level. And its lowest point, 
Laguna del Carbon is 344 feet below sea level. And they are the highest and lowest points in the southern and western hemisphere. So for that part of the globe, they have the highest point and the lowest point. Pretty cool. <clears throat> the Church of the Nazarene in Argentina has 19,000 members. They have 233 fully organized churches and 243 not yet organized churches. They have 189 district licensed ministers and 183 ordained ministries. And there are currently 15 missionaries serving in Argentina and 16 missionaries from Argentina serving globally. Isn't that cool? 15 missionaries from other places serving in Argentina and 16 missionaries from Argentina serving in other countries in the world. Giving and sending. <coughs> they have a few prayer requests they wanted to share with us. They asked that we would pray for revival in Argentina, that the Lord would bring a spirit of repentance so that the nation could walk in his justice and truth. They asked that we would pray for more workers full of passion, love, and commitment for the extension of the kingdom who join from the local district and national level. They asked that we would pray that God would bless each pastoral family, leadership, and development of each local church, that the Lord would continue to move the church to live the Great Commission and continue to lead the way to reach others through the planting of new churches. And they also asked for prayer for their upcoming district and national events, which are intended to train and mobilize the church, especially for Alo Nuestro, a national meeting of ministries to be held in June and for the National Maximum Mission event to be held in July. What does Alo Nuestro mean? A L O Nuestro. To the... Nuestro is our. To our something? I don't know. Yes, Siri. I don't speak Spanish. They have some praises to report. <coughs> They thank God for comfort, strength, and care received during the years of the pandemic. They celebrate that even in difficult times, there were many who received Christ and were added to the church. They are grateful for students who were able to graduate in theology at three levels, bachelor's, licensing, and master's degrees. They have gratitude in their hearts for the committed service of the leaders and brothers who are willing to serve the Lord. Likewise, because of new calls to mission, the Lord is raising up workers and we are being challenged to send. Um, and there is a missions testimony they wanted to share. <clears throat> okay, Joe, gonna, you're going to need to read a word here for me in a second. Can you come up and join me? <clears throat> that one. Put on the three. In February 2022, La Fe Church of the Nazarene in Central Patagonia participated in the Global Week of Prayer. Veronica Marenko testified that this year, was already a blessed one because of the local NMI council being formed. This allowed for them to engage the entire church in prayer with the rest of the world in their broader vision. You have to read that sentence. Kuala, Kuala Gwaichu Church of the Nazarene from the Mesopotamia district was able to share its generosity. Thank you. Kuala Gwaichu? Kuala Gwaichu. Kuala Gwaichu. Yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Q. Yes, the accent is on the, the accent's end. on the end because that's what the little thingy means. Okay. Yeah, the little thingy. Guale <coughs> Guai Chu. Okay, I will try. Thank you. Um, let's see. Okay, um, I found out on the noise I thought you were saying alo as one word, but it's no. no. Okay. It's an idiom. It means like let's do our business. So let's get to work. Yeah. Okay. Good stuff. So anyway, the, what we were just sharing about the Guale Guaychu, Church of the Nazarene. Um, throughout the month of February, church members helped work to help schools, hospitals, and seminaries. They promoted and taught younger generations about generosity by teaching them about alabaster. Veronica Horst said, after watching a video about alabaster, they made a church-shaped envelope and then they used it at the end of the service to collect an alabaster offering. We saw them very happy to be a part of it, and they also asked to take envelopes home in order to collect more offerings. It was a beautiful experience that will be etched in them forever. Members from the Central Patagonia District
gathered at the Fullness of Life Church of the Nazarene on the 19th of March for their second district NMI meeting. This was a time for mobilizing the church by witnessing what the Lord is doing in Mali, West Africa. Pastor Jorge Diaz stated that we are working to raise awareness of missions in our district and we believe that the Lord is at work. We were struck by what it means to serve in countries of another faith. The Coastal District held its first NMI President's Meeting on March 27th. Missionary Cynthia Peppermans gave a workshop called The Biblical Basis of Mission, Our Responsibility, Paradigms, and Challenges. Marta Cara, the District NMI President, said the Lord is opening our eyes to another way of understanding and doing missions based on His Word. Amen. One of my favorite parts there was that they're receiving missionaries and sending missionaries at the same time. Everything all together. Um, so now we can get into our more personal local prayer requests. Um, I do have a couple praises to share with you to start off. Um, one is the one I just mentioned about the hands that were donated to the Sunday breakfast mission. Um, that is such a huge blessing. And, um, you know, God has really blessed Pastor Tom with the gift of of finding people who have things to give. <laughs> I don't know exactly what you call that spiritual gift, but um, he is just really good at finding those resources, and they have been so generous in sharing with so many different churches. I know there are churches from Delaware, Maryland, further up in New Jersey, I mean, all over the place that the Sunday Breakfast Mission helps support with food. And um, for people who volunteer in the, in the pantry here, you probably know that Almost all of our meat has been coming from the mission, the bulk of our meat. Um, really everything except the hot dogs and the eggs have been coming from the mission. Um, and they give us a lot of um, shelf-stable foods as well. So we are very, very blessed. And thanks to everybody who donates to the mission to help make that possible. Um, the other one, we got, I don't know how many of you might get the newsletter from Front Step Missions. Does anybody else get that newsletter? Well, you can look them up on Facebook, or um, I don't know Pastor West's email address, but it, they have a Facebook group called Front Step. It's a, 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 a ministry of the Philadelphia First Church of the Nazarene, and uh, it's led by Pastor West Hink. Many of you might have met him. He had a tape of the district to sell. <clears throat> but they were able to purchase a house um, about a block from, from the church, um, in part through donations from Alabaster. And they're going to use that house to um, put up students coming in to do internships at the mission and do inner city missions. So that students from some of our colleges and universities can come to Philly and stay in that house and help serve the community. Um, they're going to use it for other things as well, but um, it's a huge blessing. They do need some help doing some work on the house, so if anybody knows how to fix the house, talk to Pastor West, but um, they were very excited that they were able to purchase this house. It's something they've been dreaming about for a while, but you know, those kinds of purchases are, are not cheap. <laughs> um, let's see, do you guys have any other prayer requests that you would like to share? Darlene. Darlene, yes. Um, Darlene is having some severe back pain, and uh, we're particularly, um, we're praying for her to be able to sleep through the night and for her troubles at work with her back pain. And for you? Yes, I'm having a, a laser beam in my eyeball tomorrow. So let's hope they don't pop it or anything. No. Pop it is not. They won't do that. I hope not. It is a laser beam. <laughs> That's not how that works. That's not how that works? No. Okay, good. And uh, just be thinking about Rini. Today is uh, Gary's birthday, and I know that it hit her hard. Looking for floaters? No, I, have, I have a couple holes in my retina. Oh, good grief. <coughs> They're all welcome back together using a laser. Mm -hmm. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm not having a lot of trouble with it now. Um, but this can lead to a detached retina. Yeah. So they, they are going in to seal up the holes to make sure my retina doesn't fall 
Jesus. Amazing. Yeah, I mean, this is the kind of thing that they didn't used to be able to detect. And so they didn't know you had a problem until your retina detached. And then it's made your, they actually had to do surgery and your eye to fix it. So. And my grandfather had that done. The laser or the detached retina? Yeah, the detached retina. Yeah, I've heard, I mean, I, I've never had it done, but I've heard that surgery is pretty intense. So you have to like lie on your face and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. There's something about air bubbles in your eye and all kinds of stuff. Well, I think that's the medicine. Uh, a praise for uh, Bonnie's family is Barry's getting his license, and so uh, Bonnie will be having to chauffeuring. do some a lot of chauffeuring. That she she's was. not going to know what to do with herself. Oh, yes, yeah, she will. <laughs> so many pairs of pants are going to get hemmed next year. We don't even know. Maybe and she'll make us another donkey costume. Oh, there you go. <laughs> this is what we need another donkey. Well, why? Yeah. And uh, uh, be with uh, Amy. She's uh, going through some things. Yeah, she is. Just pray for all the Zimmermans. <laughs> yes. Definitely. Um, I want to remember to pray for your neighbor, Rick. Yes. Um, if you've ever visited Jim and Carol and saw their neighbor with the goat, that's Rick. Um, he's got some heart trouble that they diagnosed him with, and it's pretty significant. Um, thank God he's a believer and has strong faith. So we're, we're praying that his faith carries him through, and whatever God sees to do through this, that God's <coughs> will would be done. He yeah. goes to the Baptist church right there close to our house. We have a couple that came in on Facebook. Uh, Jane has asked for an unspoken for Gina. And I know she doesn't ask for herself, but um, Jane is recovering from bronchitis. So please pray for her. We know that can be a long recovery, so pray that her cough stays low enough that she can get some sleep. Um, and then Venus asked for prayers for Jeremy and for some future medical tests. Yeah. Reminder to make those appointments. <laughs> Carol said make your doctor's appointments. <laughs> She's probably laughing. <laughs> I bet she is. Can I have a sip of And Jane, if Anna is listening, uh, Anna's birthday is this coming Sunday. So Gina's Anna, so Jane's granddaughter Anna. So we all got to remember to say happy birthday to Anna. And then on the 21st, which is in three days, Saturday, is Sarah Ragone's birthday and Donna Gosselin's birthday. <coughs> so those are some praises. Venus said she did make one appointment today. All right, she's going to stay on you, Venus. You better be careful. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. Um, can everybody come out to church Sunday? We're going to have new greeters. Yeah, we've got. We're trying out some new greeters this Sunday. Oh. I don't know who they could be. Yeah, I'm sure he has. Um, yeah, Joel's mom has COVID, so please pray for her. No. Yeah. Wait, your grandma Joel, that means oh, my grandma, great grandma. No. She's not a great grandma yet. She's just a really good grandma. <laughs> um, she's generally. <laughs> Healthy is not, so we're praying that there is no complications. And also praying that she doesn't give it to Jill's dad, because that's how that kind of rolls. But please pray for her. And there was something else. Oh, Lord. Yes. Do we have any updates? I really do not have any updates. Okay. Was I not supposed to say anything? I don't know. Okay, uh, Jill's co-worker, Lori, um, was assaulted last week, and she has been in intensive care in critical condition, so please pray for her. Uh, was she assaulted by a stranger or a co-worker? No, by a family member. It was a oh. domestic violence. Oh, yeah. It was domestic violence. 
So, yeah. I can't imagine. So she's, yeah, it's bad. Um, a few others I wanted to share just kind of from the church. We have one big praise to share. Uh, Charlie got word that he's expecting a new grandbaby. Uh, Ryan and Z are expecting a little girl. So they have three sons, so this will be their first little girl. And uh, her name is going to be Jada Marie. So she gets Charlie's wife Marie as a middle name. So I think that's beautiful that she gets Marie as a middle name. Um, so please pray for Ryan and Z as, as they're going through the pregnancy process. So far, no complications, and we're praying for a very boring pregnancy, right? Very boring. Yeah. Um, we got some updates on Buddy this week. He did have to go back into the ICU. He had a collapsed lung, but that has been remedied, and he's back in a regular hospital room. So, you know, he had to have the major surgery for, you know, yeah. when they were working on his esophagus. So, you know, as they're moving everything around, he ended up with a collapsed lung. But it's reinflated, and we're praying that it doesn't deflate again. And um, Charlie said he's in good spirits, <coughs> so please keep praying for him. Um, we got an update on Malcolm. Um, I know the men's group got this already, but um, they did his post-treatment scan, and they could not detect the tumor. Yay. So amen for that. So, you know, he's got, they're going to have to keep an eye on things, but it looks like he might not even need surgery. So, um, that's a big praise for Malcolm. Um, Dale, um, you know, he had surgery on his ankle a little while ago. He is out of the cast and into a removable boot, and his pain level is much better. So, those were some that came through from Charlie we wanted to share. And how's Faye? Um, Faye is home. Um, but unfortunately, they had to put her dog down this week. Oh. Yeah, Ellie Mae had been at the vet. They thought she had a torn ACL, but when they did more scans, they found that she had damage to her spine. So it sounds like it's very similar to what Daryl and Charlene went through with their dog. So she went in because she was having trouble walking, and they thought it was a leg problem, but it turned out it was uh, severe nerve damage to her spine, and there wasn't really anything they could do about it. She was in a lot of pain. So please pray for, for Faye. That's a hard thing to have to lose your pet, especially when you know you live alone. Um, but Danny's over there taking really good care of her. That's so good. We're very thankful for him, and I think Marcy's coming up to visit soon too. So um, that will be a lovely visit too. It's always nice when our family gets to come see us. Um, Eric asked us to pray for one of his neighbors. Um, he's got some alcohol trouble and has been getting into some trouble with some of the neighbors. A little bit of arguing. And so Eric's praying for peace and for calm tempers, which I think are very good things to pray for. Um, we received word that Pastor Donna Sarag is going for some testing. So we want to lift her up in our prayers. Um, can you remember what years Donna was here? She was like, she was a children's pastor here, right? She like the one us to death. Oh yeah? You gotta keep your busy, huh? I'm telling you, they ought to kill us. Yeah. <laughs> she doesn't slow down. What can you? And then globally, we've got a few things to pray for. Of course, we want to keep praying for the situation in Ukraine. Um, a large group of soldiers <coughs> surrendered to the Russian army uh, that were down in that steel factory in Mariupol. And there's some worry about what's going to happen to them. They are being transported back to Russia. So who knows what's going to happen there. Um, and then over here in the United States, of course, we had the shooting in Buffalo at the grocery store and the shooting in California at the church last weekend. Um, so lots of victims who are, are going through some pain right now. Um, we also want to remember all the parents who are uh, having to deal with the baby formula shortage right now. 
I wish we had something to give in the pantry, but we're, we've given away all we have. But uh, please pray for um, please pray for parents who are searching for formula, especially babies with with allergies that need special kinds. Um, are you guys having trouble with the hospital yet? Or you because you guys normally keep a pretty good supply on hand, right? Yeah. yeah. So those Great are some. Pastor and Mona. Yes. Thank you. Um, we received word that Pastor Jim and Mona have uh, received a call to go to uh, Asbury United Methodist Church up in Woodstown. Um, this is a church that he pastored about 10 years ago for a little while. Um, this would have been before he came to Bridgeton. So um, they have an opening and uh, they love him and he loves them. And so the, God has made it worth that he can go and pastor there again. So. Um, yeah, I already told him maybe we can partner with some food pantry stuff. Um, but That'd please pray for them. They're, I think his first official Sunday is going to be in July, July 1st, I believe. Um, that's Well, that's I don't know if that's the first Sunday, but that's when they do the, the Methodist shuffle. They, get, they all start their new assignments on July 1st. So. Thank you for the clarification on that. All yes, well, that's what I call it, right? I grew up in the United Methodist Church, so yeah, every <coughs> summer is when they shuffled everybody around, you know? You just give it a little shake and see where people land, right? <laughs> it's like a snow globe. Like a snow globe. <laughs> a snow globe of pastors. A um, couple others I want to share. Eva East asked us if we could pray for um, her daughter in law, Allie's father, who's dealing with some health issues. Also, her husband, Cisco, and her family in Puerto Rico, particularly her mother, they are going through a very significant heat wave right now. It's Eva Lisa's daughter's birthday today. Yes, I saw that posted. And it's her daughter's birthday today. Yes. Thank you for reminding me. Um, so please pray for Eva Lisa's family. We mentioned Charles. We mentioned Faye. Um, we mentioned the Petersons. We mentioned Eric's neighbor. Pastor Tom, I think we covered everything I have. Do you guys have any other prayer requests that I didn't have on the list? All right, well, let's pray together. Father God, thank you for this chance to gather together today. Uh, Father, thank you for the flowers and the life that spring brings to us. Um, Father, thank you for caring for us. I, I want to start off by, by saying thank you for the hams, Father. <laughs> thank you for sending hundreds of hams to the mission, and thank you for giving them the resources to distribute them to, to several food pantries. Father, thank you for all the hundreds of families in our area that are gonna have food to eat through that generous donation and through the work. Father, I, I thank you so much that we get to see firsthand what happens at the pantry, how every single month you just come through with blessings. And you make sure that there's enough. And Father, it's not always where we expect it to come from. And when we get these delightful surprises, and I just want to say thank you. Thank you for taking care of so many people. And thank you for letting us be a part of it. Father, I know we could never provide this food as a church. And we thank you so much for making sure that, that it comes in each month. Uh, we lift up all of our food pantry families who are going to be coming. Father, we pray that we'd be able to share not just some food for a belly, but also uh, the bread of life, that we might be able to share the good news and some time in prayer. Father, we lift up several who are in need right now. We lift up uh, Carol and Jim's neighbor, Rick. Father, we pray for um, the condition of his heart. Father, whether you would perform a miracle or give him a transplant or something else we can't even imagine, we just pray for your continued presence in his life. Father, we thank you for his faith and his testimony. And we pray that these physical trials would not, um, would not cast a shadow on those peaceful moments of faith. We lift up our sister Darlene and her back pain. Father, we pray that they would figure out what's happening, whether this is a joint issue or a nerve issue or whatever. Father, we pray that she would have restful sleep tonight and that you would help her not to strain her back more at work. Mm -hmm. Father, we lift up Rainy um, as today is Gary's birthday. Father, we thank you so much that she was able to ring the bell and celebrate her cancer treatment, but we know that 
Mourning is a long-term process, especially mourning a spouse. And so, Father, we pray for special comfort for Rini today on her husband's birthday. Father, we thank you for the testimony we received from Front Step and the purchase of the house. Father, thank you for providing that need, providing for that need. Father, thank you for the praises we heard from Argentina of receiving and sending missionaries and of sharing the gospel, of caring for young people. Father, thank you once again for these testimonies that come from around the world. And thank you for the reminder that we're connected to so many. Father, we praise you that Barry has his license back, and we, we praise, um, we know he had to go through some hoops for that, and we thank you that that's all worked out. We want to remember Amy and her children and, and the rest of the Zimmerman family, Father. Please be with them as they're all dealing with different things in life. We lift up an unspoken prayer request for Gina, and Father, we lift up Jane as she's recovering from bronchitis, and we lift up Anna as she's about to have a birthday and a prom. Uh, please be with her this week. Father, we lift up Jeremy to you and Venus and, and the medical testing that's upcoming for Venus. Please be with her as she's planning and attending doctor's appointments and dealing with all the stress that comes with that. Father, we lift up Trudy and uh, her COVID diagnosis. Father, we pray that this would be swift, that she would not have lasting effects, and that it would not spread further. Father, we lift up uh, Jill's friend Lori. Father, she's been through a terrible ordeal. We pray for her physical healing and protection right now. She's in intensive care. And Father, we pray for her heart, for her emotions, uh, for, the, for the emotional pain that she's been through through this assault. Father, we lift up um, Buddy to you. We thank you that he was able to get the lung situation straightened out. Father, we thank you for Malcolm's good news. We thank you for Dale's progress. We thank you for Ryan and Z and the, and the new baby they're expecting. Father, thank you for new life and that we can celebrate that. Father, we lift up Pastor Donna and uh, her medical testing. We pray that you would be with her in this process. We lift up Eva Lisa's family. Today's her daughter's birthday. We pray for her daughter-in-law, Allie's father. We lift up Cisco and we lift up Ivelisse's mother and the rest of her family and friends in Puerto Rico dealing with this significant heat wave. Father, we remember those in our nation who are dealing with this baby formula shortage. We pray that babies would be able to have the formula that they need, that there would not be price gouging or hoarding, and that we would all be able to share and take care of each other. Father, we lift up the victims' families from these two shootings in in New York and in California. Father, we lift up our nation to you. We know that at least the Buffalo shooting was, was racially motivated. Was the, the shooter released this manifesto about white supremacy and white nationalism and racism. Father, I pray that you would help your people, that you would help the church throughout this country speak out against that kind of hatred that you would help us to make this country a more loving and caring place, a place where everyone could be safe and where hatred would not have a home. Father, help us to share love. Um, Father, please be with us tonight as we study your word, as we continue in Ezekiel. Father, I thank you for this time, and I pray that you would continue to bless our study. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 <clears throat> okay, yeah, one last... Pray for yourself. Oh, and me too. <laughs> I don't usually write down my own prayer requests in the books. I just follow my list. We'll um, take care of it for you, don't worry. Well, thank you. Thank you, um, I did want to ask if anybody had anything from their prayer journal you might want to share anything that maybe you've read or written in the past few days or maybe maybe you're not doing a prayer journal maybe you're praying in a different way that you'd like to share about I was really excited about what I read on today yeah yeah, yeah. me too I, I did some stars and some writing today 
Um, I don't think there's very many people that realize that they're adopted into the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Yeah. We're not foster children. Amen. Yeah, I'm going to read. So the scripture for today was Romans 8.15. The spirit you have received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear. Rather, the spirit you received has brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The same way that Jesus cried Abba when he prayed. And in case you don't know, that word Abba in Hebrew is kind of like saying dad or daddy. It's a, a term of affection, almost what a child would call their father. And the same way Jesus came to God, we can come. It's mind-blowing, right? It's mind-blowing. Yeah. The part of the guided prayer... I'd like to read. This was written by Steve Hoffman, who is uh, the district superintendent of the Prairie Lakes District. I'm not sure what that is, but he says, Teach me fully to embrace my adoption as your child, so that I may live in complete dependence on you, knowing your love, which overcomes all fear. So it was a great way to take the scripture passage and turn it into a prayer. Yeah. Thank you, brother. It's really exciting. It is. I like, you know, the Apostle Paul talks about it too, that we are like branches grafted onto a tree. That we were once separate, but now we've grown together in our one organism, right? Yeah. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. Anything else anybody wanted to share about their prayer journey? If there are people that are not doing the journal, they do. I would highly, highly recommend reading it. I would too. If you from haven't started from, yet, from cover you don't cover. have to follow. It doesn't have to go by the date. Our it's a great devotional to go through. I read to, to like May 7th or something like that, mm -hmm. but I lost my prayer journal. Oh, um, well, we'll have to get your own. I think, I think, I think it's on the kitchen counter. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's some more out there on the table. We have a yeah. If need be, we'll take we ours and print it. Or we'll get you the free app. Yeah. There's still some that you printed out there. Yeah, there's still a couple bigger ones. <laughs> People really like them because the print's a little bit larger. They're easier to read. Yeah. All right, well, let's get into our Bible study. We are in the book of Ezekiel. Last week, we finished chapter 24. And so today, we are doing chapter 25. And I have high hopes that we're going to get through a whole chapter tonight. Too far. It's a shorter oh, chapter. Oh. Um, now, there are several different messages that God gave Ezekiel in this chapter. Um, one thing I want to give you kind of a hint at to look for is to look for patterns. You're going to notice as we go through that as God gives these different words to Ezekiel, the, the intro, the beginning, and the ending of these, these words are very similar as we go through. So keep an eye for that pattern, okay? And I'll help, I'll help you along a little bit. Um, would somebody read for us Ezekiel 25, verses 1 through 7? Sure. Thank you. <clears throat> this is uh, a message for Ammon. Then this message came to me from the Lord, son of man, turn and face the land of Ammon and proph prophesy <clears throat> against its people. Give the Ammonites this message from the Sovereign Lord. Hear the word of the Sovereign Lord because you cheered when my I lost my place. <clears throat> when my temple was defiled, mocked Israel in her desolation and laughed at, the, at Judah as she went away into exile. I will allow nomads from the eastern deserts to overrun your country. They will set up their camps among you and pitch their tents on your land. They will harvest all your fruit and drink the milk from your livestock. And I will turn the city of Rabbah into a pasture for camels and all the land of the Ammonites into a resting place for sheep and goats. Mm -hmm. Then you will know that I am Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. Because you clapped and danced and cheered 
with glee at the destruction of my people. I will raise my fist of judgment against you. I will give you as plunder to many nations. I will cut you off from being a nation and destroy your complete, destroy you completely. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Thank you very much. Who were the Ammonites? Okay, good question. Um, the short answer is the Ammonites were neighbors. Okay, they were a neighboring nation, and I'm going to go a little bit out of order here. Um, can somebody go back to Ezekiel 21 and read verses 19 through 21? And this will help put some of this in context. Because we've read about this city, Rabbah, before. Are you there, Joel? Mm -hmm. um, chapter 21, verses 19 to 21. Son of man, mark out two roads of the sword of the king of Babylon, the sorry in the same country. The Hesiah post where the where the road branches where the road branches off to the city. Walk out one road with the sword to come against Rabba of the um, of the Ammonites, and another against Judah and fortified Jerusalem. For the king of Babylon will stop at the fork of the road at the junction of the two roads to see the enemy. He will cast lots of arrows. He will consult his idols. He will examine the women. Thank you. Um, and we're not going to talk about examining the liver because that's gross. But so just a little bit of a geography lesson. And I want to try to do this backwards for you guys so that the east and west are right. This is Israel, OK? On their west, you have the Mediterranean Sea. So people couldn't really attack that way easily. And on the east, you had a big desert. So even if an enemy was coming from the east to attack, they kind of had to hook up and around and come in from the north, OK? So Babylon is coming, the Babylonian army was coming from the east, but they kind of have the button hook up and around, okay? Because of the desert? Because of the desert, yeah. So as they're at that spot where they're getting ready to come up and around, they kind of come to a fork in the road. Now, I, I don't know if this is a literal fork in the road, but it's making a decision, right? When the Babylonian army got to that desert, they could decide, well, I'm going to go a little bit this way and attack Ammon, or I'm going to hook around and attack Judah. So back in Ezekiel 21, we're told that the Babylonian army came to that decision, that they were either going to attack Rabbah or attack Jerusalem. And they decided to attack Jerusalem. Okay. Now, how did the people of Ammon react when Babylon decided to attack Jerusalem instead of them? They were happy. Verse 6 says, they clapped and danced and cheered with glee at the destruction of my people. Yep. So I just wanted to do that little bit of a backtrack. They weren't just happy that Jerusalem was being destroyed. They were happy that Babylon went after Jerusalem instead of them. Okay? They so chose, does that make sense? Yeah, they chose them instead of them. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but as you know, with bullies, right? If a bully chooses to pick on somebody else instead of you, does that mean you're... Free and clear? No. No, it usually just means you're next on the list. And that's kind of what Babylon did. Babylon built a giant empire. And so they might have dodged it on the first round, but yeah. Celebrating because the bully picked on somebody else doesn't change the fact that there's a bully. Nope. All right, so we kind of went out of order. So this question is going to sound funny, but bear with me. In the previous prophecies we've been reading, even though they were against people against a nation, who were they against? All the ones we've been reading up to this point. Babylon. Who would? The, against Babylon? Well, not, not quite yet. It was against Judah and, and Jerusalem. <coughs> oh, okay. Ezekiel's been prophesying against the people, against the leaders in the land, against the priests. Right? So it's God telling the people of Israel, you're going to suffer this consequence because of what you did. In the beginning of chapter 24 is when the siege of Jerusalem began, okay? So where we are in the timeline, the big attack on Jerusalem, it has begun. It's not over yet because the siege takes a long time. 
But in chapter 24, the siege begins at the beginning of chapter 24. Ezekiel's wife dies partway through. And then at the end, it says the people will receive word that their family members and children have died in the siege of Jerusalem. So that's kind of where we ended chapter 24. The siege had begun, and the exiles in Babylon are getting word back that their family and friends are dying in this war. Um, so now Ezekiel changes gears, and instead of preaching, instead of talking about Israel or Babylon, which are really the two countries we've mostly focused on up to this point, we're now starting to talk about some of the other neighbors, other people who are involved in this. So we begin with Ammon, or Ammon, um, and what's going on. So let's go back to verse 3. Why did God decide to punish them in verse 3? Because they cheered. Yeah. And there are three specific instances, or three specific things they celebrated. They, temp they celebrated when the temple was defiled. Right. They mocked Israel in her desolation, so the destruction of the land. And laughed at Judah. And they laughed as she went away into exile. Mm -hmm. Right? So the, the defilement of the temple, the destruction of the land, and the people being carried off into <coughs> exile. Um, this is one of those things. <laughs> Have you ever heard the joke that if you want to listen to a happy song, play a country song in reverse? Right? Oh, it's great because then your dog comes back to life, your pickup truck starts running, and your wife comes back. <laughs> That's a country song in reverse. When the people arrive into the promised land, we get the opposite of these three things, right? They come into the land, the land is built up, and the temple is built. Okay, or consecrated. Now, those things are happening in reverse. It's like we're taking the Abrahamic blessing, the coming into the promised land, and we're, we're rewinding it. Right? So we're going from a place where the people are in the land, they have a sovereign nation, and they have a temple. Now, all of a sudden, they're not in the land, the nation's destroyed, and the temple's been defiled. Right? So it's kind of undoing the promise. So they weren't just happy that Israel got beat up. There's a religious aspect to this, too. And we don't talk about it quite as much in modern warfare, but back then it was a very strong belief that if you went to war and you won, it was because your God was stronger. And if you went to war and lost, what did that mean about your God? They were weaker. Weak, right? So this is like the Ammonites saying, well, Babylon went to destroy them because their God is weak and our God is tough and Babylon was afraid of our God. Right? And their God, you know, couldn't even protect his own temple and all, all that kind of blasphemy stuff. Right? So they're dancing, they're celebrating at, at Judah's pain, at Jerusalem's destruction. And God says that they will face a punishment for this. In verse 4, what is the punishment that they will face? Going to their land will become barren. Nomads from the eastern desert. Yeah, nomads will come in. They'll take everything. And this phrase, they will harvest your fruit and drink the milk from your livestock. I mean, apart from the actual eating, what do you think that implies? They're going to lose everything and let the camels run wild. Yeah, they're going to lose everything. <coughs> Everything that you worked for, everything that you built up is gone. You know, when you, especially back then, you couldn't go to the grocery store and get strawberries in California, right? So when you planted your crop, that was a huge investment in your life. And if that crop failed or was stolen, you couldn't make it another year. People would die, yeah. right? And your livestock, that was like their bank account. That was their 401k and their social security. You know, when, when crops were good, you built up your flock, and then when you went through a time of famine, or there was no rain, or the land was, the crops were bad, the crops failed, you could eat your flock, and th that was like your bank account, right? Um, so, basically, everything you put your trust in is going to be taken and given to other people. What's the way they build that a piece of gold that's stronger than God? Well... They did. They did. 
And this is part, we've kind of talked about this a little bit, but one of the reasons God was so strong to prophesy over and over and over again that he was behind this is because he wanted to make sure that people understood what was happening. He wanted to make sure that the people understood that Jerusalem was not conquered because Babylon was stronger. That Jerusalem was conquered because God removed his blessing from them because of their sin. So it was important that they understood rightly what was happening. It's like a father spanking this child. Yeah, and they laughed at it, and God's saying, oh, go ahead and laugh, you're going to get yours. Yeah. But a spank you say you'll behave, and Israel doesn't learn. Yeah. Nope. So we've got the prophecy against the Ammonites. We've got the description of what they did wrong to, to Israel, or Jerusalem. We've got the, dis the description of their punishment. And then there's a fourth part in this pattern. Did you recognize a phrase at the end of verse 7? This is maybe a sentence you've heard a bunch of times before. The very end of verse 7. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Yeah, and then you will know that I am the Lord. I'm speaking this word about what's to come, so that when it happens, you will know that God is God. That this was prophecy from God, and that it's true and real because it happened the way God said it was. When these nomads come in and destroy you, then you will know that I am the Lord. Did he have to call us the Ammonites? He was directly speaking in Babylon to the people, but it was written down so that it would be remembered later. So you might remember, do you remember how things started, how chapter 24 started off? Uh, Take a peek at the beginning of chapter 24. Oh, in the ninth year, in the tenth month, on the tenth day. Yeah, they wrote down the date. Why do you think Ezekiel had them write down the date? So that they would know when the prophecy written. Yeah, so that when they got news, because it took time for news to travel. So it would be like if I said, on Wednesday, May 18th, something's going to happen in Antarctica. So that a month later, when you find out in June, Oh, it happened on May 18th? That's when you said it was going to happen. So it was giving the people context. Um, a war was not that unique in that time and place. But to say a certain nation is going to attack in a certain way on a certain day, that was the prophecy. And Ezekiel is speaking about this before it happens so that it can be written down. Now, is this a word of warning to the Ammonites? Yes. Yeah. Well, maybe, but so when he speaks to Israel, he's directly telling them this is going to happen to you very soon. But is Ezekiel talking to the Ammonites? Where is Ezekiel? Babylon. Babylon. He's in Babylon, and he turns his face towards the Ammonites, which I don't know what direction the Ammonites would be from here. Actually, east, so not yay. So, turn your face to the Ammonites, but he's actually speaking to the Jewish exiles. Why do you think it would be so important for God to give a message to Ezekiel about the Ammonites to be heard by the Jewish exiles? So the Jewish exiles learn. So they would know, right? So they would know that, that the Ammonites are going to be punished for their part in what happened. Right. Now, this is a little bit of a trick question, so I don't have a good way to word it without just giving you the answer. Why would God want to tell the Jewish people about the future punishment of their enemies? They were not alone. Yeah, perfect. So that they would know that they're not alone. This is kind of a spoiler for the end of the chapter, but it's so that they would know that God has not abandoned them. And right. God is God, and he has spoken. Right. This is going to happen. Yeah. So this is, I know these are words against other nations, but this is where we're starting to turn the corner. You know, up until chapter 24, everything that we were saying was about the coming destruction. But now that the destruction is here, the word to Ezekiel is going to involve the future. And for, for the Jewish people, the Jewish exiles in Babylon, that means God is saying there will be a future. Things are, this is happening, the war is happening, people are dying, you can't even really mourn because of what's happening, 
But there is going to be a tomorrow. The people will not be completely destroyed. There is a faithful remnant, and things will be restored later. So this is the beginning of planting the seeds of hope. So now we can go a little bit faster as we go through the next couple sections because you guys are so smart and you know the pattern. So let's read verses 8 through 11 next. All right. Thank you. This is what the sovereign word says. Because Moab and Seir said, look, the house of Judah has become like all the other nations. Therefore, I will expose the plank of Moab, beginning at its frontier towns, Beth, Jeshua, Baal, Mayon, and Kiriathayim the glory of the land. I will give Moab along with the Ammonites to the people of the east as a possession, but the Ammonites will not be remembered among the nations, and I will inflict punishment on Moab, then they will know that I am the Lord. Thank you. So we're starting to see the pattern, right? Who is this prophecy against? People of Moab. The people of Moab, okay. And what's going to happen to them? Uh, verse 8. Oh no, sorry. What did they do wrong? I skipped the question. What did they do wrong to deserve punishment? It's the second half of verse 8. They've said that the house of Judah has become like all the other nations. Like all the other nations. I'm going to pause there for a second. Why is it such a bad thing for Moab to say that Judah has become like all the other nations. He's saying that God is a, a speaking against God. Speaking against God and speaking against the Abrahamic covenant, right? The covenant is I'm going to set you apart as my special possession. And when Moab says you're just like everybody else, Moab is saying that, that wasn't true. Yeah, but Moab was um, the son of Lot. Yes, that's true. It's strange, isn't it? It is, it is. And there are a few different Moabites who step into the story. Um, just a couple weeks ago, we talked about the story of Ruth. Do you know where Ruth was from? Mm -hmm. Ruth was a Moabite. So we have a Moabite in the bloodline of Jesus. So Moab is being punished for speaking against Israel. But they're not quite punished in the same way that the Ammonites are. So, did you have a question? Yes. Um, it says the flank of Moab. What is the flank of Moab? Your flank is your side. Oh. Yep. And it's kind of a military term. So, to flank an enemy means... Um, all right. Can you guys stand up for a second? Right. Hold on. No, no, not yet, not yet, not yet. Stand by <laughs> so, let's say Jill's my enemy, and I'm coming to attack her, right? <coughs> I know, okay, and I'm coming. Now, just side flank me. Attacks from the side, right? I'm going this way, and then I get attacked from the side, right? Yep. Uh, Just like your rib cage is vulnerable, right? Yeah. It's uh, it's like the liver punch of the boxing. Who's right? Pretty much. <laughs> I enjoyed that visual lesson. Did you enjoy? Thank you for your. Thank you, Flanker. It's pretty much like being attacked from out of your Supper side punch. of your peripheral vision. Supper punch. Ah. No, would you just never see it coming? Yeah. Anybody? I've been. You ever been sucker punched? I got popped right in the eye at a baseball game one time. Didn't I? Don't even know who did it. Somebody was like behind me, kind of there, and boom, right in the eye. That's what. That's going to happen to Moab, right? Yeah. Now the difference is, um, in verse ten, what is what is the ultimate fate of the Ammonites? You know, they'll no longer be counted among the nations. They'll no longer be remembered among the nations. What do you think that means? Written out of history. Yeah, they're not a country anymore. <coughs> right. Right. Yeah. Like they're Italy. eliminated. Like what? Like Italy. Sure. <laughs> what? Well, Italy's it's not a really big fancy. It was the Roman Empire at one point. Yeah, now. And it's, it's still there, but it's not like it used to be. It's not I hear you. They crucified Christ. Italy literally got the boot. 
<laughs> Good one. As a Sasonian, I take offense to that. <laughs> wow. Pardon me, but my grandchildren have a giant. I know. I'll tease it. I'll it's tease okay. It. We love Sasonian. No, it's a good point. Something that used to be a big, giant empire and is now for lack of a better term, insignificant in the terms of history. Yeah, but didn't God say that that would happen to them? Yes. Yeah, yes. That's, you know. So, that's what he said. Um, the Ammonites, they're no longer even going to be remembered, but right. Moab is going to get attacked by the same people that attack the Ammonites, uh, these nomads from the eastern deserts. So, they said that Judah was just like all the other nations. That's what they did wrong. Their punishment is that they will be attacked by these, these nomads, in the same way that the Ammonites are, although not as severely as the Ammonites. And then, again, in verse 11 at the end, did you notice a familiar phrase? Then you will know that I am the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> you will know that you were wrong to say that Judah is not special among the nations. Right. All right. Good questions, you guys. That's for about. That's true. This is the biblical version of wait until your father gets home and dad just got home. <laughs> yeah. And he's taking care of business. Exactly. That's abuse. Yeah. You don't have to be afraid of your father all day long. Yeah. All right. Well, and I know there's there's baggage there, oh, but I know. They, they broke the rules, they were warned, and now they're getting the punishment. So let, we have another nation, and this one's a little, we're kind of getting a little bit more personal as we go, right? Like the Moabites, we have some blood crossover with, with Israel and the royal line. Um, but now we're going to talk about another nation that's even, well, that's more closely related. Can somebody read Ezekiel 25, verses 12 to 14? Hello, Eric. Glad you could join us, brother. Sorry, I'm not excited. Uh, 12 to 14. Who wants to read it? Thank you, Ken. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. Because Edom took revenge on the house of Judah and became very guilty by doing so. Therefore, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. I will stretch out my hand against Edom and kill its men and their animals. I will lay it waste and from... Came into Dedan, they will fall by the sword. I will take vengeance on Edom by the hand of my people Israel, and they will deal with Edom in accordance with my anger and my wrath. They will know that my vengeance, they will know, and they will know my vengeance, declares the sovereign Lord. Thank you. So we've got a pattern, but with a slight variation here. So first question, who is this prophecy against? Edom. Edom. Does anyone know who the Edomites are or who their progenitor was, who their founding father was? I'll give you a hint. It involves body hair and lentil stew. Oh, um, Jacob. Close. Esau. Esau, yes. <laughs> yes. So remember, Jacob had... Jacob was a twin. He had a twin brother named Esau, right? Who had a big red beard and he was very hairy. That's why Jacob wrapped goat hair around his arm to pretend, right? And and Esau sold his birthright for the bowl of stew. Remember? Um, good job. Body hair and a bowl of stew. Um, so this is part of the family, right? The, the Edomites they descend from Isaac just like Jacob did, although there's a difference. The big difference between Esau and Jacob and their bloodlines is that God's blessing went down through the bloodline of Jacob, but Esau rejected God's blessing. He gave away his blessing, and therefore he steps away. Esau gave away. Oh, right. His birthright and his blessing, he gave away both. Well, he gave away his birthright, his blessing was stolen. Yeah. I, I did, I also but this is the separate family lines, right? And you might remember when you read in Genesis about Jacob coming back right after he wrestles by the river, when he wrestles with God, and then he meets Esau, what happens? Do they go to war? No, they actually do okay right then. But as anybody who's been to a family barbecue knows, whenever there's a conflict in there somewhere, it's going to pop up later, right? 
And so that's what happens between the Israelites and the Edomites. They get along okay for a little while when it's just the two brothers, but as the families grow and there's conflicts over wells and pasture land and that kind of stuff, the, the fighting or the animosity gets worse and worse. They begin to hate each other. And in this case, so we talked about the who. What is it that the Edomites did wrong in verse 12? They sinned greatly by avenging themselves against the people of Judah. By avenging themselves against the people of Judah. Okay, yeah. What does it mean to avenge? So I, um, so I Payback. Payback, yeah. yeah. Like, my son, uh, avenge me. <laughs> right? I'm saying, you need to fight back and get the person who got me, right? Yeah. Right? No, not me. You get my enemy. Yeah, I'm gonna get him. Right? Yeah. You know, it's 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 I'm gonna get the person who got you. I'm gonna settle the score. I'm gonna get even. Right? But usually, when people get even, what do they do? Do they just get even? No. Do they get a little bit more? Right? Yeah. You get one of ours. We're gonna get ten of yours. Right? And what does that? What That's kind what of revenge does to people? Right. So. The Edomites decided to take this opportunity when Judah was down and come over and kick them, right? Kicked them while they were down. Yeah. So the Edomites come over and they, they attack Judah to make up for this, these past issues that they've had. Okay. Now, there is a difference here, though. In this case, who is going to carry out this, this punishment against the Edomites? Verse 14 people of Israel. Yeah! I will accomplish this by the people of Israel. But wait, aren't they under siege and carried off as prisoners? How are they going to carry <coughs> off this now? What does that imply? If God says it, it's going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> so eventually, they're going to be strong enough to be a country again. Yeah. And they're going to be able to carry out God's prophecy. So right now, they're still on the ground and he do not kick them. And they're all they're beat up and bloody and, and messed up, right? But right, this is like the end of Rocky One. He's beat up and on the ground, but pretty soon he's gonna be strong enough to fight the Russian. Right? You know? It's it's proving that there is a future hope. Okay? Um, Israel is beat down, but not destroyed. They are not hopeless. No. So even though right now they are completely impotent, they cannot defend themselves against Babylon. They will be completely destroyed, their weapons carried off, their people killed, the people who are left are going to be slaves for 70 years. All those things are true, and that's part of their story, it's part of their reality, and it's because of what they did, but it's not the end of their story, right? There is hope here. So the destruction of Edom carried out by the Israelites gives the Israelites hope that they're going to be a country again. They're going to be a country again. And again, I, the Sovereign Lord, have spoken. Right? Yeah. yeah. Um, we've got one more nation to speak against, and I think that'll, that wraps up the chapter, and that'll be a good place for us to stop. So can somebody read 15 through 17? And this is a hard one to say. I usually pronounce it Philistia. But if you say Philistia, that's okay, too. We are Philistia. They are the Philistines. Dude, spoilers. I didn't ask the question yet. <laughs> Can somebody read 15 to 17, please? Well, it says Philistine in the second sentence. Can somebody read 15 I'll, to 17? I'll read it. Thank you. This is what the sovereign word says. Because the Philistines acted in vengeance and took revenge of malice in their hearts, and with ancient hostility so, sought to destroy Judah, therefore, this is what the sovereign word says. I'm about to stretch out my hand against the Philistines, and I will cut off the Carathites and destroy those remaining along the coast. I will carry out great vengeance on them and punish them in my wrath. Then they will know that I am the Lord when I take vengeance on them. Thank you. So, same pattern, another slight variation, but let's get into our pattern. Who is this word spoken against? <laughs> the Philistines. Who are the Philistines? Do you know any famous Philistines? Paul. Goliath. Goliath. Oh. 
<laughs> we should play charades sometime. Right. That was my nine foot tall giant. Right? Goliath was a Philistine, right? Yeah. yeah. Paul was right, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm going to get Paul was from Tarsus. But. <laughs> so when King Saul became king, he inherited a war. Do you know who that war was against? The Philistines. King Saul was not able to defeat the Philistines. When David fought Goliath, he was a Philistine. And when David became king and he fought all those wars, guess who all those wars were against? Philistines. The Philistines. And it was a very bitter war. At one point, the Philistines even captured the Ark of the Covenant. Right? So, you know, this was a real this is really bad. They were really, really significant enemies of particularly Judah. Most of their raids were in the south, in Judah, where Jerusalem is. So the Philistines and Judah had a really bitter history. Isn't that when the Philistines, isn't it when the Philistines took the off of the continent that they got like really, really sick? They did. They got really, really sick and decided they needed to get rid of it. And they put it in the temple with their god and the statue of their god fell over and his head fell off. Yeah. Yes. And then they were like, well, we don't want to give it back, but we don't want to keep it. So they put it on a cart tied to new cattle that had never plowed or walked a road before. And guess where those cattle walked? Right, into right back to Jerusalem. Yeah. So God made sure that the ark came back. Now in a similar way, who is going to carry out the punishment against the Philistines? Remember, the first couple was the nomads from the east. And then for the Edomites, it was Israel themselves who were going to carry out the, the punishment against Edom. Who is going to carry out the punishment against the Philistines? God himself. God himself. Yeah. I will execute terrible vengeance against them to punish them for what they have done. That's verse 17. So like no match from the east, that's bad. The Israelite army under the blessing of God, that's even tougher. But who are the Philistines going to face? Who's going to face them? God. God himself will bring his vengeance against them. Yeah. God himself. And again, we close with, and they will know that I am the Lord. Yeah. Oh, you aren't going to die to you this time. So. How can anybody be reading this and not think that God's going to do something? Well, let's talk in, about in that. In his will. I know that Jesus came to save us, but God is still God. And all of history has not been written yet. That's true. I mean, I don't think there's a simple answer to that question, but... <clears throat> I mean, for sake of discussion, there are some people in the world who might not have read the Bible or know about God, so we'll take them out of the equation for now. Mm -hmm. But people who do know about God, people who have read the Bible or heard the Word of God, why do you think people refuse to acknowledge Him as Lord? You lose faith. Yeah, they think it's just in the book. Think about it this way. Let's talk about the Philistines, right? They had that whole experience where they, where they watched Goliath get killed by a farm kid, where they, they took the Ark of the Covenant, they got the biggest prize, like in Capture the Flag, this is the biggest prize there could be, right? Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> this is like God's recliner, right? And yet, what happened? God made sure it went right back to Israel. So why did the Philistines continue to reject the sovereignty of God? Why did Adam and Eve eat the fruit? Their will. They wanted to do it their own way. Right? Yeah. They're not willing to accept the fact that they're not in charge. Or maybe to ask a deeper question, why did the people in Jerusalem end up in this situation in the first place? They refused to obey God. Yeah, and they wanted to do things their way. Yeah, they built, you know, a room <coughs> to worship idols in the temple. They sacrificed their own children. Mm -hmm. They persecuted the weak and the poor. They didn't care for the, the widows and the orphans and the immigrants like they were commanded to. They only did what was best for them. Wait, am I talking about Israel or am I talking about America? Not that different, right? When nations become just, just rich, change the name. we see this repeated through history. So Kay mentioned the Roman Empire, right? 
and how they fell and were destroyed. When, when Babylon comes in, it begins this series of world empires, right? And you can read the, the, the dream in Daniel about the statue with the different metals that kind of talks about this. But, you know, we've got, first it's the Babylonians, then the Medes, then the Persians, right? Then the Greeks, then eventually the Romans. But you have this wave of empire after empire that kind of takes over the known world. And each one is bigger than the last. But there's one thing that they all have in common. They all fall. They all fall. And they all fall when they become decadent, right? When they become so absorbed by power and wealth and prestige that they lose, they, they completely lose their morality, they completely lose their ethics. You know, the Roman Empire, before it fell, you know, they were feeding Christians to bears and lions in the Colosseum. They were, they were burning Christians in the streets, you know? They, they were doing these, and, and these are kinds of things that you just, you don't do this to another person, right? You don't do this to an animal, let alone another person. But they were doing it for sport. And so we see that this is what tends to happen to empires. They get big and they begin to trust in themselves. So to connect this to Jesus in the New Testament, this is not that different from the conversation he has with the rich young ruler, Right? This man says, I followed all your rules. What do I need to do to inherit the kingdom of God? And Jesus says, sell everything you have and give your money to the poor. And the man walks away sad because he's not willing to do that. That's it, right? Money, power, success, control over our own lives. It's what we just read about in Jeremiah on, during the sermon on Sunday from Jeremiah chapter 9, right? That the people put their trust in their wealth and in their power and in their wisdom. But these things will bring you to nothing. So that's what people tend to do. We tend to put our trust in ourselves. We trust in our wisdom, our power, and our resources. Um, but those things will always have an end. We always think, oh, it's okay, I don't need God, I can take care of this, until it's too late. And in this series of stories, we see these, these people, they only come to know that, that God is sovereign when they receive their punishment in their time of destruction. Right? The hope of the New Testament, particularly what we're going to be celebrating at Pentecost as we talk about the acts of the Holy Spirit, is that it doesn't have to be that way. Right? It, you don't have to wait until destruction to recognize that God is God. You can recognize that God is God right now. You can receive the grace of his love. You can be washed clean by the blood of Christ, and you can be adopted as his child like we talked about in the beginning. Right? We can do that now. It doesn't have to get to that point. Right. It doesn't have to get to the point of destruction before we turn to God. But some people, and if we read through the book of Revelation, you find that there are some who choose to be finally unrepentant. That even as the bowls of wrath are poured out and they recognize that it's coming from God, they still refuse to bow a knee to God. So that pride is going to carry some people straight to hell. It's going to forever separate them from God. But it doesn't have to be that way. So just like Israel in this story, we're starting to see the seeds of hope. I think that's part of what God wants us to see in these prophets. That bad choices bring about bad results. That when we reject God as our sovereign Lord, we will go down a destructive path. But it doesn't have to stay that way. No. Our pride is, the only pride we should have is in the Lord. Pride goes and before the, the fall, and, and fear of the Lord, Lord is the heart of wisdom. Right, and what the Lord gives us. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And we have to use our heads to do what the Lord tells us to do as far as taking care of our responsibilities. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, but and we need to support being, each other in that. Right, that's not being prideful. That's just being... Yeah. We need to keep our eye on the prize. One of the reasons yeah. Jerusalem got into so much trouble is that the priests and the leaders in the royal families, they were all corrupt, and they were leading the people right into punishment. But that's where the Great Commission comes in for us. That we, as Christians in the world, are supposed to serve the role of Ezekiel. Like Ezekiel is told in a little bit, that God is setting him up as a watchman on the wall. Right? And spoilers, but it's in the Bible, and you should have read it already. God tells Ezekiel, you are a watchman on the wall. If the enemy comes and you do not warn the people and they die, 
Their blood will be on your hands. But if the enemy comes and you warn the people and they refuse to listen, then their blood will be on their own hands and you will be free of wrongdoing. So that's where this is leading for us. We need to try our very best to share this truth with as many people as possible so that people are able to make that choice and turn away before it's too late. Because a funeral is too late for that person who's died. Right? So let's do it before we get there. Yeah. Anything else anybody wants to say about Ezekiel 25 before we wrap things up? All right. Chapter 26 is another word against the nation, but it's a longer word against one single nation. And I'll give you a hint. This is why I give you wiped out of history. They got wiped out so bad, it took a thousand years for archaeologists to figure out where this city even was. Right? They really got wiped out. So. Uh, no, this is Tyre. Oh. But let's pray together. So Father God, thank you for this word. Thank you for the prophecy you gave to Ezekiel. Thank you for the people who wrote this down and the way it got given to us. Father, thank you that there were people who shared this word with us. And Father, help us to take it into our hearts. Help us to hear these warnings. Help us to hear this hope. And help us to live as your people under your sovereign rule. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 <coughs> All right, good night, Eric. Good night, Venus. Good night, Jane. Uh, yeah. Good night, everybody. <laughs> 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 <laughs>